Hello and welcome to Artifacts, the monthly show on Cable 34 in which we talk about the arts and arts related issues here in Minneapolis. We've got an exciting show, uh, quite a variety of guests and topics to talk about here on City Cable 34 with Artifacts. Uh, in a little bit we're going to introduce Mark Balma who's a fresco artist here at the University of St. Thomas, downtown Minneapolis. But to lead into that segment, uh, we're going to take a look at a piece uh, our crew went out and uh, taped here just a week or two ago. So take a look at this uh, and we'll come back to the artist in a moment. It's not the Sistine Chapel. However, the fresco technique being used here is the same technique Michelangelo used to do the Sistine Chapel. Where is here? Here is the ceiling of the lobby of the College of St. Thomas in downtown Minneapolis. What exactly is the fresco technique? There are four basic steps to this technique. down the wall and um, and after the wall is properly wet then we'll begin laying the rusty our plaster and we'll begin laying down the first thin layers and we build it up until we uh, will join it up to this uh, this day line it's called a day line from the last couple day sections um, you can see right here uh, this line will uh, disappear we're gonna we do a, a egg tempera retouching um, just like uh, they've been doing for about a thousand years. This line will, will, the line basically will always be there, but we can make the, um, we can make the, as far as seeing it uh, from below, we can make that uh, fade in pretty well. In fact, um, there's a day line over here. Uh, when you get, when we start to get really, really good at it, you can see how, uh, you can barely see it right here, how we've hit, we've really hidden the line, and from 30 feet down, you'd never see that. And 30 Each of the assistants um, was given a bird, and this is my bird, Fred, and he's a sandhill crane. Um, we do our drawings, and then we transfer it once it's drawn onto a tissue like this. Okay, once you've traced your cartoon, like Kristen traced Fred, then you uh, Use carpet as the best surface to do it because it uh, it gives and it doesn't catch. And you take a pricking tool, I'm not pricking needle, I'm not sure really if there's a technical name for it. And uh, about a fourth of an inch apart, um, you make little dots over all the lines. And anytime a line intersects with another line, you have to put a dot there because once you transfer it on the ceiling, it'll get confusing because it'll just be a bunch of dots. And then that tissue is held up onto the ceiling and pounced with a bag of pigment. And then the dots transfer where the holes are punched in the paper, it transfers onto the ceiling. And then we uh, connect the dots. And, and that's our, our tracing to work from. right now is the Bianco di San Giovanni, St. John's White. This will be used um, for the pigment, the white pigment that he will be using as he paints. And also, this is put into other colors to uh, act as a binder to help with the permanence. And it's also used to lighten colors. It's just like white paint.
looking at are uh, some of the images that are very impressive down here already at the University of St. Thomas in downtown Minneapolis. And uh, Mark Balma is uh, an artist, a fresco artist in particular, and we're going to chat with him for a few moments about his art and the work that he's doing here. But I thought I'd mention one or two things about the University of St. Thomas. Um, this is their uh, second largest of their four campuses, something I didn't realize. They're also in Chaska and uh, Owatonna, I believe, as well as St. Paul. And uh, they've already become uh, the second largest graduate school of business in the United States. So right here in downtown Minneapolis, there's quite a lot of uh, activity in their uh, university. They started out in the old Powers Building, downtown Minneapolis, about five years ago or so. And I think the response uh, on what must be the West Metro area was so great that they decided, uh, heck, let's build a building down here. And one of the great gifts that they're giving to the citizens of uh, the Twin Cities area are these uh, seven, uh, actually more than seven, because you're going to be doing some other um, uh, frescoes as well, but starting out with seven uh, panels on the ceiling here in the great atrium here. So I want to introduce uh, Mark Balma. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. Fresco artist. Um, I want to get into a little bit about the artwork, but first I want to start with uh, you yourself. You're a, you're a young person, mm -hmm. but you knew you were going to do art at an early age, as I understand it, uh, as early as kindergarten. How did, what, what attracted you to the visual arts? Uh, from the earliest, uh, my earliest recollections, I remember drawing a great deal and uh, interested in, uh, in color and, and just uh, in the stories that drawings that uh, uh, communicating ideas through through drawings and I, as a young uh, child I used to copy quite a bit of the comic book uh, and even the narrative sequence of a comic book I think has a has that uh, storytelling obviously storytelling ability but um, and I attending parochial school I was encouraged by um, some of my teachers whom gave me the uh, commission in those, uh, to to draw St. Anthony and, and try to bring about a message to which would be communicated to the other students. So I think from, an early, from the earliest age, I was lucky to have encouragement, uh, which really helped uh, develop my bend toward murals and uh, public artwork. Sure, and so some, sometimes it was the teachers encouraging, but you also had a drive that must have been in, inside yourself, because again, at an early age, a teenager, you decided to take some classes uh, over at the Atelier Lac. Yes, uh, I just turned 16. In fact, I'd just gotten my driver's license, and uh, I enrolled in Richard Lack's uh, night program, but also began to take half days of uh, school and condense my classes in high school to the early, uh, before noon, and then take the afternoons and study drawing and painting with Richard Lack. Quite a discipline right there. I should mention too, um, you were growing up at the time out in New Hope, right. so right. Twin City, and anyhow. Yes, in those days it was still very much a suburb. Today it's become actually part of the metro area, but uh, it was by chance that my next door neighbor knew Richard Lack. Otherwise, I think I, you know, I would have never known his school was not a a, a very publicly known place at that time. Uh, this was back in 1974. Was it in Uptown at the time? It was in Uptown, but in a much years. different location. It was used to be above the old Snyder's building, uh, oh, where see. they burned down there on the corner. And well, they tore down and they made Calhoun Square there. Remember the old bowling sure, alley sure. there? Yeah. Used well, to there. yeah. So that's uh, okay. that's actually where the school used to be before right. it moved across the street, and and so it, uh, uh, that's where I, be, I began with Richard Lack. Okay. And there was the uh, my understanding of that particular atelier is that there's a classic, more of a classical uh, grounding there. It's a drawing of. Uh, uh, it's a drawing and painting school, but the basis of everything that he teaches there is a strong uh, uh, basic training in drawing. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, which fortunately is, is the, one of the major requirements for, for fresco painting is a very, very competent drawing skills. Well, now, there, thank you for the lead-in. How did you get into frescoes? I mean, was uh, that something you discovered at LAC, or had you gone to Italy by that time? Or? Well, as a... Uh, as a child going through the art library in, in my high school or in, in uh, uh, grade school, I was very attracted to these the large murals and the, and the works that tended to be uh, not paintings, but to actually be part of the architecture. Art and architecture, I, I think, work very well together. And I'm very inspired by arch um, architecture. 
And so I, I, I think that as I, in, uh, beginning to attend Lack, I mean, uh, Lack School, he talked of mural painting as being one of those higher forms of, of uh, representation and that, and that it is really the sort of pinnacle of, of the visual arts is mural work. And in, in fact, in Western culture, uh, some of the greatest paintings known today are mural paintings in, in themselves. And so, but it wasn't until I actually got to Italy when I was 18 years old and uh, had written Pietro Anigoni after seeing his work in, a, in the library that I, I really knew that uh, it was fresco and the, uh, the concept of, uh, of putting art in, in on the everyday um, spaces that we, we live mm -hmm. uh, and work in. So he became, in essence, your mentor, if yes. I will? Yes. Pietro Anigoni was, uh, had finished really teaching and home, uh, he had apprentices. He never ran a school. And so you went there with a a reason to be there and, and uh, his critiques as well as his guidance were very important for me at that period and uh, it was very, very helpful for me. And you were doing some shows over there, I mean you were in some shows. How did the University of St. Thomas now back on this side of the Atlantic hear or know about you? Uh, well, I've been in Italy since 1980 off and on. and uh, Working on, uh, after my wife and I in 1988 decided that we were going to move to Assisi. That, uh, after moving there, we were approached by the Franciscans to begin a very large commission there um, and, and uh, undertake a 15-year commission for the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli, uh, the birthplace of the Franciscan order. And then the university heard about this through an, art, an article and uh, some friends here uh, heard about this project and at that time it was just coincidentally that they were beginning their Minneapolis campus mm -hmm. uh, designs and everything was still on the blueprint in the blueprint stage in architectural drawings. So at that point it began to uh, be considered the, the idea of uh, incorporating a fresco and not to make it a second thought but actually to incorporate it. And I guess it. back to your interest in the architecture. Exactly. Am I right in guessing then that you very much like to be in at that planning stage again? Definitely. Oh definitely. Definitely. Right. Uh, uh, you must the art and the architecture must work in harmony with each other. And so much of what happens today in, uh, in, in decorating a building seems to be, well, once we'll just get the building structure up and then we'll just spot a few things here and there. Right. Place and it. Place and it as in, you say, in a second thought. Yeah. And uh, you lose that cohesiveness between the, between the art and the architecture in that, in that kind of process. So this is one of those rare opportunities that the artist and architect work together and they create a, a, an environment which is of, of uh, very refined uh, uh, ideals. Tell us, if you will, a little bit about the uh, work you're doing up here in the uh, ceiling area of uh, the atrium. Here. The, the ceiling is divided into seven ceiling sections and uh, measures approximately 16 and a half by uh, 112 feet. We began a very long s process of, of bringing the ideas out. And that's a two-year process of, of, of creating the imagery of, in a sense, of, of the idea or the concept. And uh, from that point, working with committees, here, both here at St. Thomas and going out into the community and asking opinions of different people about what this really re should represent or what, what were the, 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 the dynamics of this project. Mm. Uh, this is in a, for a private commission, so as a public commission, one must be aware and sensitive to the many different issues which involve creating a, a public work of art. In that sense, I, I, I took it upon myself to investigate as much as possible, give meaning to the, a work that was going to be created for St. Thomas, but also to have it work with the community here at large and something that could be appreciated from somebody maybe that maybe never uh, attend this university. Mm -hmm. but will be walking down the street and pop, pop in to just right. kind of see what, what, uh, what the murals are or the frescoes are. So in that sense, I was very sensitive to a variety of, of, of perceptions, even the, from the point of from a young child. Um, I've used animal symbols in here. Um, and because I found in representing the virtues, which the subject is, that our culture tends to put our highest ideals in animal form. Interesting. And, and so that's why, I, I, and that inspiration came after 
uh, a couple of years of working and bringing out the designs and trying to, uh, to approach some of the uh, differences of, of, of the perceptions of the people, what they felt about this art. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. This, I'd put myself in the spot if I asked myself this question. You're doing the seven virtues. Can you name them? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, faith, hope, and charity. Justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. Okay, and which ones are going up right now? We're doing, we've done faith, justice, prudence, and hope. Okay, and this comes out of some of the uh, writings of uh, St. Thomas. Thomas himself. Writings of St. Thomas, but again, using different kinds of symbols from different ethnic groups. Uh, in prudence, the dragon is a strong and very important Asian symbol and which uh, the, uh, symbolizes wisdom. And so prudence in life is making the wise choice and confronting the, the unknown in, in a wise and prudent fashion. Mm -hmm. The symbol of justice. Now justice has always been very well known for the balance or the scales, but it's always been empty, in fact. That's true. So, uh, and and uh, I put on the, on the justice uh, or in the justice panel on the scales, I put the figure of a man and woman. They're balanced in life, but also it's so much not so much of equality, but a, a balance in, in the approach to life, mm -hmm. which is so important, I think, mm -hmm. today. Um, and then faith is represented by uh, three people sitting on a giant turtle, and that actually symbolize, uh, is an important Native American symbol for the creation theme. And it ties very well into uh, the our you know the Western thought of the Noah's Ark and the, the emergence of the from water. Okay, and and, and the lots of birds I noticed yeah. in that lead-in piece there. Actually, birds in 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 both from coming from Egyptian art, but even in, in Native American uh, artwork, bull, birds are considered the souls of the river, mm. the, the many souls of the river. So I it, it, it becomes. Uh, because the river is such an important symbol, and certainly one this year, yeah, because of the of the flooding and whatnot, yeah. but the the river is our Nile, and and is a geographically important symbol that runs from the the beginning of of this uh, uh, continent and to almost and, and it spills out of it. So we have birds represented from the Mississippi Flyway Zone, which from Minnesota all the way to Louisiana. Ah. And how did you determine which birds to use? Well, they they had to be birds which actually lived along the river mm -hmm. and were and 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 their representation of that uh, uh, symbol of that continuation but for instance ducks which happen to be in the justice panel according to the Native American symbolism that they were the most uh, uh, being that there were pairs I put them pairs of ducks is because they were they mated for life uh, uh. so that that's an important symbol there well, as well sure. So. Let's shift gears uh, briefly here. Uh, obviously, I've been up on the scaffold there with you a week or so ago. You've got a lot of assistants up there. How, who are they, and how did you find the right people to work with? Well, uh, as the project became uh, publicized, m students came on their uh, own accord. And there were about uh, a couple dozen applications, and I chose people that had a strong interest and who had been on their own in the art uh, uh, community. Here from the Twin Cities, I had one assistant who came to uh, came with me from Italy, but most of them have are freelance and or uh, painters and and pursuing their own career. That somehow they feel that this will be a, a an important addition to their skills and definitely a a they've gotten a sense of the the requirement that it is a group effort. It's very hard to do a solo fresco. Yeah, I imagine yeah. the scale for one thing and then the complexity of sure. it. You mentioned it's a two year process, but you also had to cure yep. something a year in advance. The, the lime was slaked and put into barrels and allowed to sit under water for uh, that, uh, that period of time because it, it, it um, softens the lime and helps the colors sit better into the lime. Otherwise, lime as, as an alkaline base would burn the colors. Yeah. And so that's, that's an important process. It's not something that happens quickly. I mean, it, the fresco takes longer to, to make than the building does to, uh, that's did to create. Yes. So. From when they break ground to exactly. finish the building. Oh, yes. Meanwhile, you're gearing up before and now after sure. and throughout that whole process. Yep. That's amazing. If people were to come down here now into the summer of 93, obviously the scaffolding's up. When you're done in this season, I understand climate has something to do with mm -hmm. your time frame here. What will they see, and then what's the rest of the time frame for you, the finishing and the completion of this? Well, uh, until uh, the gala event here, which is September 18th, they're going to 
the, the room will be scaffolded if they can observe from the second floor. But after that point, the, uh, the ceiling, uh, more than half, four of the seven panels will be painted this year. And the last three will be painted next year um, from June to August. Okay, June of, uh, to August of 94. Then. Exactly, 94. Great. That's wonderful. You mentioned the gala, yeah. and as I understand it, that has something to do with some fundraising and celebration yes. of and, the project. And the unveiling is uh, traditionally, um, even in the Sistine Chapel, when the, half the ceiling was finished, the Pope had the scaffolding pulled down and, and half of the ceiling was unveiled to, yeah. to, and it really does help uh, people understand the the dynamic process that goes through in the creation of it. It all isn't just a, a single effort in, in, a, mm -hmm. in a single time frame, but it's an evolving art form, and I'll make changes between seeing this half finished and mm -hmm. giving me a chance as well to make any adjustments that I would like in the last three. Now you're obviously doing this process, uh, it's a couple years mm -hmm. long, and you've got the 15 year, which I, as an artist I think that must be very satisfying. I mean, that's, that's a long gig to get a yeah. 15 year <laughs> thing. Yeah, it is. Yes. Are there, that's an Azizi. Yeah. Are there other projects you're working on or uh, personal, maybe smaller scale things you're working on? Uh, there are some other murals that I'll be, be doing here, possibly uh, one, one here in, uh, in the Twin Cities as well. But I have my own work that I do in my studio that is uh, done in egg tempera that is very much uh, uh, a change, a switch from the large monumental works mm. all the way to smaller, very, very uh, uh, intimate pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's how I find the balance. So you work in a variety of media yep. and obviously different scale and things right, like that. Right. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure to have you on and, and a real gift that you and the university are giving to us here in Minneapolis. I yes. look forward to seeing each stage of the completion. Thank you. It's thanks an honor for, for me as well, too. Thanks for being on the show. Bye -bye. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back in a moment. Next up uh, will be uh, Lou Pham. Now that you got a chance to uh, take a view here at the scaffolding and maybe a little bit at a distance of the work they're doing upstairs on these uh, frescoes at uh, the University of St. Thomas. Well, my next guest is Lou Pham, uh, someone I just met recently. He's a writer and uh, active, at least to some extent, in the Asian American uh, art scene here in the Twin Cities. And Lou, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great. And you are indeed a writer. Um, mm -hmm. You shared with me some of your poetry uh, some weeks back, but you just told me that you do other kinds of writing as well. What right, do you do? Right. Uh, I'm actually an editor as well as a, uh, I write essays and criticism as well. Um, it's it's. Uh, I actually started out in prose mostly, um, and and the prose that I was writing happened to to have qualities in it that were very visual and very imagistic and and a dynamic of language that, that seemed to fit with um, a, a form like poetry. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I've been alternating between both of those. Um, and right now I'm working on a piece of criticism for Amerasia Journal at UCLA um, on Andochine, which was a recent movie from France starring Catherine Deneuve about uh, Vietnam uh, during the colonial French right, colonial. Academy Award nominee, anyhow. Right, I forget exactly. if it won anything. Sure. So you're, you're criticizing that film for the publication. Right. right. You have good things to say about it? <laughs> uh, not that many. Good okay, things. so you get a copy and read the uh, yeah. criticism. When will that come out later this year? Uh, they should be having a journal or uh, an issue devoted entirely to Southeast Asian issues. Um, later this year, okay. beginning of next year. Great, but you're also published as a, as a poet. Mm -hmm. I see you brought uh, something here that you were recently published in? Right, right. This is uh, the Berkeley Poetry Review. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this, this um, journal is it, it really publishes a lot of um, unpublished writers, uh, mm -hmm. young writers uh, in the area, and also established writers. Uh, for instance, in here is also Robert Howes, uh, Tom Gunn, other oh, sure, sure. Other poets around here. Well, now you've made a couple references to California, so you've got a California connection. What is that? Exactly. Well, I, I uh, spent five years there going to school at, at UC Berkeley and studying history. And, uh, and essentially, um, growing up as a Californian, in a sense, okay. uh, that, that is the source of my um, 
I guess my energies and, and yeah. you know my view is directed west in, in more ways than one. And uh, I returned to Minnesota. I actually grew up here in Minnesota. I spent uh, about eight years here from 1980 until 88 mm -hmm. as a child and a teenager. And uh, returning because my grandfather and my mother are both here, and, and I wanted to spend some time. Family with them, right? ties. Okay, so that was why you came back. What are the differences you see, at least culturally? Uh, lots well, of differences, climatic and all Certainly that. there's a lot fewer Asians. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess um, it, it's really hard for me to assess right now, you know, the, the, in, in any other way than kind of a superficial way what mm. the differences are. No but, impressions in but, but, you know, interactions are, are much more polite, but they don't seem to be quite as open in some ways, and I think maybe that has to do with, um, I don't know, just culturally, just, just the way people... It's kind of a reserve, you mean? Or, yeah. Or, or, or are you sensing a hostility or something? It's not necessarily hostility so much as um, there, there isn't this excitement about the possibility of new ideas that, that I sense when, I, when I'm in California because um, there's such a huge mix of people and, and such a potential for... Uh, that kind of sharing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a bit more homogenous here. Uh, that might I, have I probably something to do so, with yeah. it. And maybe people's cultural imaginations and historical imaginations um, are such that uh, they that y you tend to look more towards the past rather than uh, the possibility of a future that, that is very different. Yeah, uh, California. And again, maybe we should be specific. What part of California? Northern, southern? Um, most, uh, well, yeah, there, there are definite distinctions between Northern and Southern California, yeah. and, you know, Southern California is often looked down upon by Northern California, <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. Um, but in general, it's such a, a hodgepodge of, of um, people uh, and, and uh, the mix of, of people's experiences and, cu and cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And um, even within an ethnicity, uh, say Asian Americans, there is such a huge diversity. Um, and one of the things about uh, California is that all these groups have reached sort of um, a critical mass such that they really impact upon um, the cultural imagination there. Yeah. And uh, that's something that's really significant to me, the, the, the idea of cultural imagination, people's consciousness of, of um, you know, what constitutes their group, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and what is within um, their realm of experience and understanding what is outside of it. Um, in California, it's very easy for people to incorporate different things and new ideas because they're constantly exposed to it. It's, it's there, it's in their face. It's part of the currency of how they right. do things, whereas right. here you're finding it a, a kind of a harder sell to put exactly, a new idea Exactly, it is. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it, it's not a bad thing right now. It's, it's, it's something that has to develop over time. And like I said, there's a critical mass yeah. in California. Yeah. Which there isn't here, sure. But there, but here there are certain experiences um, that I think uh, really point to a future for Minneapolis-St. Paul mm -hmm. that will s somehow um, be comparable to that in California. There's there's a very vibrant art scene, um, and uh, and as someone who's recently returned to this scene, are you finding that you're welcome into that art scene? Are you finding avenues to express yourself? And uh, well, I, I located Asian American Renaissance, which was an organization actually uh, begun by um, several people, but, but uh, mostly through you know, the uh, success of David Murrah, who's mm -hmm. a, another who's writer, a writer yeah. uh, based here. Uh, he's very well known uh, elsewhere in the country, and especially in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and I think through the sheer force of his own will, uh, he created some of the energies that are, are, that are going on here. Um, and uh, so that was one avenue that sure. I found. Um, sure. Otherwise, there, 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 are, um, there are fewer you know, ways to create new, new organizations here. Um, yeah. And you know, people power is, is one thing that's a little bit lacking. But, but mm. I think it, there's a lot of potential. Well, we've got a minute or two left, and we're going to end uh, our conversation with something you're going to read for us, and I'm pleased that you will. I noticed in reading uh, what you shared with me earlier, a lot of discussion, at least in what you gave me, about family and memories. Mm -hmm. uh, and you came back here in part because of family. Is exactly. a big part of, of yeah. Lufam, uh, the person and the artist? Yeah. Um, my belief in poetry and in, and in the power of language and the, and the use of language of, as communication is the way that it can 
be used as a tool to search into the personal. Mm -hmm. And the personal is something that intersects with the societal and the cultural. Mm. Um, and for me, um, my family's experiences is, is, a, is an experience that um, needs to be voiced. But through that voicing, um, it, it captures some of the, it, it resonates with a larger experience mm -hmm. of, uh, for instance, Southeast Asian refugees uh, and, and Asian immigrants in general. Um, Your uh, one poem, Watching Over Family Memories, I found very poignant and yet universal at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was very specific, obviously, some mm -hmm. specific memories there, but right. it exactly. meant a lot to me. Would you uh, honor us with uh, a reading? Yeah, actually. Uh, I won't be reading that poem, but I would like to read another poem which uh, meant a lot to me to write. Uh, my father died in 1975 at uh, the fall of Saigon, and uh, he in fact um, had been an officer in, in South Vietnamese Army and uh, made sure that his family got out of the country uh, when the communists uh, took over uh, South Vietnam. Uh, but he stayed behind and uh, later committed suicide because officers were being rounded up for um, re-education camps. And uh, it's always been a, an issue that I've struggled with. And, and I finally was able to write a poem about him. Um, during his life, he was a writer as well. Mm. And uh, so his pen names will appear in this poem. OK, thank you. He's always written his name to indicate the year. He departs, leaves a note. Mother, call from a bright room in Los Angeles. Remind them quietly, the anniversary, the last letter written, 1975. With a candle lit below a photograph, think of the broad figure he cut. Remember the words if you can, all you children fleeing across the landscape. Daughter in New York, daughter in Atlanta, daughter in Ohio, daughter in Portland, daughter in Los Angeles, son in Minneapolis, son in Berkeley arriving. My father began from the urban coast, took a bus to the other sea in 1969, four years after Selma, three times the trek from Hanoi to Saigon, 1954. He reached Washington, D.C., loved the wheat fields, visited Monticello, hated California, wrote his beloved son, Busboy, in Sausalito, don't settle our family there, 1972. Having never left, Thomas Jefferson spoke to him from a desk portrait. On the wall, Abraham Lincoln bit his lip, dried his skin, 1862. In the Saigon twilight, his desk took small scratches, 1975. There was only one occupation for a young man in Vietnam. From his army barracks, he published poems, Mak Li Diao, 1952. His desk took casualty reports, enemy movements, classified documents, and his stories, Long Ya, The Squall, Fan Yulang, 1962. Lu Pham, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. And we're back after that nice poem, uh, that moving poem by Lou Pham. My guest now is uh, Steve Barbario. He's the executive director of Child's Play Theater Company. And Steve, it's been a pleasure over the years to know you and work with you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Steve is involved not only with Child's Play, but uh, a number of programs through Child's Play uh, involved in uh, the city of Minneapolis. And you're a writer or director on your own. Right, right. In fact, uh, right now, my, uh, my two current projects uh, uh, one will be The Merchant of Venice that I'm directing for the Minnesota Shakespeare Company that will open September 3rd down at the Hennepin Center for the Arts. So uh, in addition to my work at Child's Play Theater, I also try to freelance and yeah. get some work. And I remember places. seeing a show, Jacob's Flight. Right. Which uh, was down, at, down to the theater garage. Theater garage, a right. Years ago. Yeah. yeah. So that was good. That was then one that I wrote and produced and had uh, a local director uh, direct it for me. Uh, Merchant of Venice. Now that's going to be an interesting play. To, uh, yeah, we're direct. setting it. We're setting it in 1937 Italy at the oh. apex of Mussolini's power. Yeah. At a time in Europe when uh, anti-Semitism and racism and prejudice yeah. was at its peak, uh, focusing on the racial intolerance of the time. 
and uh, very moving and powerful piece uh, and humorous yeah. in some ways yeah. as well uh, but we're taking a look more at the ironic humor yeah. within the piece yeah uh, so it's uh, it's an exciting project. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, I was just reading uh, somebody's uh, take on uh, the characterization, Shakespeare's characterizations there, some of his characters, mm -hmm. and uh, how over history some of those characters have been played sympathetically or not sympathetically. Yes, and Shylock is a good example. Oh, and, my word. Uh, there's a new book out uh, by a, a British writer named John Gross that is uh, an excellent study of, of Shylock over, over time. Over time. Yeah. And how he has become much more of a mythical figure mm -hmm. than just a character in a play yeah. and uh, it's a fascinating book. Yeah. And of course in this case uh, Minnesota Shakespeare Company is going indoors. Right. Which is right. a stretch for them. Yes. I've been working with them for about the past year um, mm -hmm. on some management issues kind of wearing one hat and another yeah. uh, and we've done some fundraising. We received uh, an MRAC grant, Metro Regional Arts Council mm -hmm. grant, uh, a General Mills Foundation grant of five thousand uh, dollars, and that all has enabled us to finance an indoor season this well, year. Good for you. So, That's great. Yeah, we're excited. It's a, an exciting project. Sure, but if I may say, your day job, as it were, is probably with Child's Play Theater. Oh right? yes, it's that's the bulk that's, of your time. That's the the bulk of my time, and then some. Yeah, and then some, I, yeah. no doubt. Now, tell us a little bit about Child's Play for the sake of those folks who know nothing about it. Uh, what is it? Where is it? And what okay, do you? Okay, well, Child's Play Theater provides uh, young people with uh, production and educational experiences in theater. Uh, we aim for high quality. We aim for uh, diverse creativity and uh, seek to build the character of the young people involved. Uh, the majority of the actors in our productions are young people ages 10 to 21. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally we have adults in shows, um, but the focus mm -hmm. is on kids and the yeah. development of them as individuals and as artists. Right. And uh, most all of those shows, the main stage shows, mm -hmm. are done out in uh, Hopkins. In Hopkins at uh, the Eisenhower Community Center on right. Highway 7. Uh, our offices are in Edina currently. <laughs> so you've got uh, a metro-based uh, right, organization. Right. And our second stage program is uh, uh, wherever we can find a space and a, and a collaborator. We right. seek to collaborate with other agencies. Uh, one of the main emphases on uh, on our second stage program is uh, to explore other cultures, to explore um, uh, social sec concerns mm -hmm. relevant to adolescents. The two projects that we have going this fall, the first is the Diary of Anne Frank, which will be done in conjunction with the Anne Frank in the World exhibit coming to St. Paul in August through October. Uh, they came to us asking us if we would produce the Diary of Anne Frank uh, in conjunction with the exhibit. So that will appear uh, September 11th through the 25th at the uh, Jerome Hill Theater in mm. St. Paul. Okay. And uh, I just cast that with a multiracial cast and seeking to strip down some of the uh, the specifics of it being a Jewish experience. It, mm -hmm. it most certainly is related to the Holocaust, mm -hmm. but it could happen to anyone and does happen to Well, anyone. and interesting, I just saw a piece on the network news about a young girl about 11 years old in Bosnia mm -hmm. who at the request of her parents is keeping a diary. Yes. She's not a prisoner as such, but she is a prisoner of the war, if you will. Well, she's and oppressed they, because of her, her, her ethnicity. ethnicity. That's right. And they likened it to the diary of Anne Frank yes. in the sense that perhaps years from now people will see this as a snapshot again if you will of uh, right. a pretty tough right. experience they're going through right right now. and so, so uh, now you've done some of these second stage things I know in Minneapolis a couple right. um, Hennepin Center for the Arts I think was one right location. we've done uh, really all over Minneapolis uh, the the most significant really in, in our history of second stage was a project we did with North High School mm. on racism and prejudice where we put together a group of young people from uh, North High St. Paul Central and the western suburbs to explore issues of racism. Uh, and uh, it was a fascinating process and, and, a, and a high quality product that we were proud of. Uh, this fall we're producing uh, The Outsiders with Washburn High School oh. uh, at Washburn. The Outsiders is the story of a group of, of kids uh, in two different gangs. One is a uh, more stereotypical greaser gang and mm. the other is a gang of social elites and how they clash and how they really need to come together in order to make their lives more fulfilling and successful. Now as I recall, at least in the origins of your second stage, mm -hmm. uh, once upon a time called Left of Center, right. 
um, you tended to workshop these shows. Are you still doing that, or are they well, scripted now? Well, uh, we, we've sought to diversify a little bit. On occasion, we'll script them in rehearsal mm -hmm. uh, with the outsiders. That's a piece that's already scripted, and right. we'll uh, workshop some of the issues involved, okay. but the scripting will be, uh, the production will be more standard in terms of theatrical production. Okay. Unfortunately, we only got a couple more minutes, yeah. and there's a lot sure. more I want to talk with you about. You have established, with Child's Play, a relationship with uh, the Sheridan School up yes. in northeast Minneapolis. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing there? Sure. In a, in a nutshell, uh, a major objective of Child's Play Theater is to diversify, reach more uh, communities of color, more at-risk young people uh, in the, within the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul, but most specifically Minneapolis. Sheridan is the global arts magnet of the east side of Minneapolis. We're, we've been working with them for a couple of years on some arts programming, arts education, production programs. Uh, we're also working uh, uh, very preliminarily on developing the Ritz Theater in North Which is just a block away, essentially, from the, the Sheridan School. Right, right. right. We met last night with uh, the East Side Neighborhood Center uh, yeah. to discuss really the character of East, the East Side and mm -hmm. uh, how we as a, an arts producing organization might fit into that community, mm -hmm. what their needs are, what we have to offer them. And uh, Council Member Birnett was involved and he really uh, gave us a good perspective on the Third Ward and we're, we're really delighted to be a part of that project. I can imagine lots of hurdles in, because I've been in that building and yes. it has some structural needs. Yes. If all was to go according to plan, when might uh, neighbors and citizens get up and see something in the old Ritz? Well, we're, uh, we're, a we're all aiming for uh, the fall of 94. Oh. I think given political realities, financial difficulties, and yeah. so on, uh, I think we could look to 1995 as a time when that space may be, again, a performing arts space. And uh, in, uh, in the same kind of context then with the, the Sheridan School and the kids getting their arts experience there? And the, the concept is really to, be, uh, to have it be a collaboration. Other groups we've talked with are uh, the Frank Theater, uh, Sheridan Elementary as a global arts mm -hmm. magnet, uh, Child's Play Theater Company, West Bank School of Music, wow. a number of arts organizations coming together uh, for the benefit of young people. Wow, it's that's exciting. quite eclectic. Yes. Steve, I think we're going to have to have you back on and get an update on that. I'd appreciate Steve, it. Steve, thanks for joining thanks us. Thank you. Very Always something amazing to learn about uh, the arts in Minneapolis. Uh, large numbers and things going on all the time. Well, my next guest is somebody that I've actually been looking forward to having on the show for a long time, Evelyn Hamry, somebody that I met uh, through the public housing in Minneapolis, actually, um, with the, I believe it was the High Rise Troopers. That's right. Evelyn, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for asking me. And I've, you may have been a guest on this show a few years ago. Were you on uh, Artifacts uh -huh. with uh, Nicole Nemi? I don't believe so. I don't remember it. Okay. If I, I heard a rumor, but yeah. I know you've been around. Mm -hmm. um, I think I first heard of you when you were doing a show with uh, At the Foot of the Mountain. That's right. And what was that show about? That was the Ladies for Lunch. It was a story of the building downtown, the store downtown whose restaurant was, tea room was going to be closed. And there were three elderly ladies who decided that they didn't like that idea. So they went through all kinds of things to get petitions and, and to help keep their tea room because that's where they had they'd gone with their children and they'd gone with their mothers. And they even uh, dressed as Vikings and stole into the Vikings dressing room. They, they kidnapped the police chief of Minneapolis and held him overnight and uh, things like that. But the tea room closed anyway. But it was a fun show. We started out to perform two weekends, three times each weekend, ended up with 87 performances. Oh my word. And we went all over the United States. Yeah, it was a real hit. Yeah, it really was yeah. fun. And at times people will say, hey, I saw you in there. Aren't you gonna do it again? Well, of course, the lady who wrote the play is not even in Minneapolis anymore. So yeah. I don't know whether they could resurrect it or not. Two of the members have passed away that were part of our group. But basically we're together. One of the members and I 
are still very active in the Ladies Who Tell, which is a spin-off of the Ladies Who Lunch. And instead of learning a script, we are telling our own stories from way back when we were children, when our parents were children. And it's very interesting. We get a young audience who really enjoys us. We've done an awful lot with the Minneapolis Public Schools. We've gone to many, many public schools and told oh, okay. stories to kids. Yeah. Usually with children, you need something in your hand to explain other than just a story. So I have a collection of Cupid dolls, so I took that one time and brought back as to how Cupids were in my life for many years, and which is a big thing that has been resurrected now yeah. as a keepsake. And the children were very excited over that. One of the girls had a, a wooden doll that she had gotten when she was a little girl, actually, actually made out of wood. And she'd had it all those, she brought that. The children were very excited. Then we go to rest homes where you're telling all of the altogether different story. Like when you tell about, um, we went one time and we told about the armistice storm. Mm -hmm. And we had people who were veterans in the rest home. In fact, it was a ring of 12 or 15 wheelchairs. They were all in wheelchairs. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that's happening to us as old women. Yeah. <laughs> And we're still in and the high-rise And a great rise thing to share with the students, too. Well, yeah, and we enjoy it immensely. Yeah. Now, you and go as a team? I mean, a couple <coughs> of them go at a time? No, we go as a group. We oh, oh, always so try to get all of us. We had it started out with, like, 10. A couple of people moved out of town. Some people got a little too crippled, didn't want to belong. We're down to five, but we're pretty good about going. We're telling stories all over the city of Minneapolis, and... And we're just having. Well, as I understand it too, I, I get the uh, Minnesota Storytellers calendar, mm -hmm. and you're not only in the schools, but you're at the restaurants and the cafes mm -hmm. and places like mm -hmm. this. We're having fun. It's yeah. a lot of fun. I, fun. I'm still in the High Rise Troopers, which you spoke of. We are working on a a spoof of meetings for the residents now, which we are showing what is wrong. Excuse <coughs> me. What is wrong about how you conduct a meeting and how many things can happen. The only trouble is now we've gotten older. We're having an awful time remembering lines. I, no one knew. I can't believe that, though. I mean, you're, I, I just, you're right I, on top of I everything. Have an, I have an awful time remembering when I'm supposed to say this and say that. And well, I'm not the only one. We're all, we're all old ladies. So, so improvisation becomes part of this. I, a little bit, only then yeah. you throw off the next guy. We aren't, we aren't hip enough anymore. Years ago, when we were in the ladies who lunch, we were well, that's eight years ago, eight or nine yeah. years ago. Yeah. It makes a lot of difference when you get up in age as to how you react to things. And uh, then we could improv and the next guy could pick it up. Yeah. But now it doesn't work. Now, I've seen some of the work the troopers have done, and you've mm -hmm. done, I remember the work order. Um, and what you're doing basically through theater is you're telling your fellow residents how that's to right. get the job done. And okay. that phone number, I remember you would. You would uh, sing that out, um, and now you're spoofing the meeting? Sounds like a very now useful thing. The, yes, it's, that's the idea. We've gotten a, grant, a couple of grants. The High Rise mm -hmm. Rep Council has gotten a couple of grants to put this on, mm -hmm. and so that we can have a director. We have a director right now, uh, David West. You know David mm -hmm. West? I'm familiar with the name. David yeah. West is our director. In fact, he wrote our play, and uh, our, every time he comes with something different than... He has a hard time with us old women because we don't <laughs> want to do what he wants us to do. Now, is it but, all is it all women at this point? Yes. I remember it, when I was working with you a little bit, there were one or two gentlemen that uh -huh, joined in a but bit. But you can't get them to come. Yeah. They they think that's beneath them. See, they don't. That's nothing for them to be in. Yeah. They'll go to meetings and they'll preside at meetings. Yeah. But to get up and act in front of their fellow citizens, they don't like. Isn't this so, a little shy or something? Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. Well, now, eight years ago when you started with the, At the Foot of the Mountain with the Ladies Who Lunch, mm -hmm. had you done theater or storytelling before that? Mm -hmm. no. no. No, no. artistic I, background? You know, no, no artistic background. I was in a couple of plays in school, like here. When I was yeah. a wee little kid, I was Tom Thumb's wife yeah. at his wedding. I can remember that. I didn't do any couple of high school plays, but nothing. But when I moved into the high rise, uh, there was a notice on the board saying, have you ever acted or would you ever have an idea you'd like to? If yeah. so, call this number. And I called the number and I was picked up with a van and taken to the People Center, which is the building where the foot of the mountain was located. That's right, yeah. 
and I met Phyllis Jane Rhodes. And uh, first meeting I went to, I said, that's not for me. And I decided I didn't want anything to do with it. She said, oh, give us one more chance, anyhow. So I went back and evidently she talked to the director because instead of doing exercises, which I thought had nothing to do with storytelling, and yet I have found that they do. <laughs> you need to do your breathing if you're going to tell yeah. stories or, yeah. or act. And uh, I came back in the second we had the improv and it was really fun. Evelyn, so, we, we've only got about a minute left. Yeah. When I first met you, it was through Phyllis Jane Rose. That's right. And she didn't know who I was talking about when I said Evelyn. She said, oh, you mean Coach. Mm -hmm. How'd you get that nickname? Well, uh, when I was, uh, well, it was fact when I had my first son. I lived in an area in Red Wing, and my husband and I were both on softball teams, or at that time we called it kitten ball, it wasn't mm -hmm. called softball. Basically there's a little bit of difference between a kitten ball and a softball. And uh, um, Phyllis Jane happened to hear that I had been on that. Well, she was a pitcher and a captain for a neighborhood softball team. And she wanted to know, we, she stood and, and I had a certain little quirk how I threw the ball. And well, she says, from that, you're my coach. From now on, you can be my coach. <laughs> That's where I got the name. So it was a softball <laughs> Still sticks with kitten me, ball yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> Evelyn, thanks for being on the show. It was fun. I, I look forward it. to hearing some stories. Well, And uh, people, if they want to hear, well, I get the calendar and uh, they can get in touch with the Minnesota Storytelling League to yeah. see where ladies who tell might be performing. The Seward Cafe. Coming up at the Seward Cafe. Uh -huh, that's in, in uh, the 11th of November, I believe. Okay, so in November at least. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for Good having me. Good to see you again. And now please uh, take a look and a listen to this next uh, feature here on Artifacts, and we'll be back with the man who made it possible in just a moment. Welcome to Arts Phone, the Twin Cities Arts Information Line. You can use this service whether or not you have touch tone. It should even work from a rotary phone. Press 1 for the Arts Phone hotline. Press 2 to leave a message in the Arts Phone voice mailbox. Press 3 to be transferred to the Minnesota Association of Community Theaters MACT hotline for auditions, job openings, and upcoming events in Minnesota community theaters. You can also press 4 to demonstrate the automated ticketing feature of Arts Phone. Welcome to the Arts Phone Hotline. Please note that the hotline is updated every Friday afternoon. Press 1 to spell the name of a theater or the title of a play that you're interested in. Or press 2 for a list of plays. And you'll be able to be transferred automatically to the theater of your choice. For comedies, press 1. For dramas, press 2. For musicals, press 3. For children's theater and other theater, press 4. You're going to hear a list of theaters. At any time during this list, you can press 1 to be transferred to the theater you're listening to, or press 2 to skip to the next theater, or press 3 to exit the list. Thanks for using Arts Phone. And once again, we're back, and uh, on this segment, uh, I've got a gentleman here that uh, is providing a great service to uh, folks who enjoy theater in particular, but the arts in general here in Minneapolis, Bob Malice. Bob, thanks for joining us on Artifacts. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Bob has put together uh, something called Arts Phone, and you just got a chance to uh, uh, listen to an actual call that our crack crew put into uh, Arts Phone and kind of test the system. Bob, for those of us uh, that are watching that have never uh, made use of Arts Phone, or maybe don't even know what the heck it is, tell us what Arts Phone is. Arts Phone is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, automated arts hotline. It gives people information at this point on what plays are going on in Twin Cities. It does more than just tell you about the play. It also transfers you to whatever theater you are interested in. If you call up and end up getting information on the Guthrie, you can choose to be transferred directly to the box office of the Guthrie or any one of 30 or 40 other groups here in the Twin Cities. And get right down to reserving your ticket. Right. Yeah, right. or probably getting more information too if you needed to. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I developed it at first as a, an actual automated ticketing service, which has been used by a couple of small theaters. 
my idea was that somebody like the Guthrie could use it for off hours ticketing or for overflow ticketing for those times when you call the Guthrie and you can't get through. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that they have some exclusive contracts with their software people, oh, so see. that's a pretty tough thing to crack. Right. So I concentrated on the hotline feature, uh, basing it off of something that the city of Atlanta has and also the city of Los Angeles has one. And for something you said once in an earlier conversation, there are only a few places that have anything like this in the whole country. Yeah, I just wanted to try it out, see if I could put it together technically, and it does run fine. I thought that when I checked with other cities around the country, I'd find most major cities had this, but they don't. Atlanta was the one I found that has probably the most comprehensive one. Mm -hmm. uh, they are funded by the city, by the city council, and run out of the city of, of Atlanta. Los Angeles has another comprehensive arts hotline. Theirs is used for the half-price ticketing mm. in L.A. Uh, New York has a half-price ticket booth for theater, but L.A. is so spread out that they yeah. couldn't have one location for that, so they use the phone line for that. Okay. Now, when you say this is kind of a challenge, you, you wanted to see if you could do it. Was it difficult? Yeah. It really wasn't that difficult. I worked at a company where we took in our payments via the phone, uh, automated payments over the phone instead of people sending in checks. It worked real well for the company and I just wondered whether it would be possible to have ticketing, theater ticketing done that way. So I have a PC at home just like anybody else's PC. Mm -hmm. It's off the shelf kind of yeah, stuff. Nothing special with a couple of special components that will take in the calls and process them and uh, play back the digitized voice files that make up the, the hotline. So it took a couple of months and it was yeah. up and running. The big problem really is marketing and, and publicity. In other words, getting people to know that it exists. Yeah, and yeah. getting someone to, in effect, sponsor it. Sure. Um, I'm pretty much going at this on my own. Like right. I this said, is a uh, gift you're, you're really making at this point anyhow yeah. to the citizens of the local area. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have a, a pretty good job and I don't have to worry about making money from this, so mm -hmm. I'm hoping to provide it just a, as a service. That's but right. I still will need someone to come in and, and be behind it to provide some hours to put together all the arts information to make it more comprehensive. Well, in the minute or two we've got left, uh, obviously you felt there was sort of a, a technological challenge and that's part of your own background, but you must love the theater. I mean, wh why? Why are you doing this? Well, I, I'm an actor here in the Twin Cities, um, mm -hmm. not, a, not a union actor. I, I've done some uh, non-union and uh, some, some paying work. but. Uh, I've been involved in the theater for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and so that's where my interest in the theater comes in, and then my profession is a computer programmer for the university. Uh. So I'm just trying to combine the two. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and, and I, I do want to mention that one real unique thing about this hotline is, although I'm sure you use a touchtone phone, you don't need a touchtone phone to use this. Anybody with a uh, phone. Yeah, anybody with a phone, even the Pulse phone or uh, even a rotary dial phone. Now, I've got to say, when I read that in your press release, I was astounded because almost all these services that you get, you know, over the television or wherever it says now on your touchtone phone, you can do this. How do you manage to do that with a dial phone? I mean... Well, the, the company that I'm dealing with that provides the software that I use has a special feature that allows you to accept Pulse as well as touchtone. Okay. So, it's not something I invented, but right. uh, I'm utilizing with what they and you already chose have. to make use of that technology. Right. So anybody right. that's watching this show that has a phone, anyone can call and and you must know this number. What is the number to call for? Number is three seven seven three five four seven or three seven seven flip. It actually spells flip. out flip. So and just coincidentally, it spells out flip. I tell right. you. Okay. Right. Well, now obviously, folks got a chance to take a look at our. Uh, little lead into this segment so they got to see it and see it in action. It's as easy as anything I've called it, I've making use of it, so uh, hopefully people will do two things. One, just call it and make use of it and then maybe uh, somebody out there is interested in uh, partnering with you. Sure, and if you call in one of the options is to leave a message with any comments or suggestions how to make it better so you can leave that also. Great. Bob, thanks for coming on and telling us about uh, Arts Phone. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back next month with more interesting guests about the arts. If you've seen anything uh, on this show that you're interested in learning more about, you can call us at the City Cable uh, Hotline, which is 673-2234. Uh, and we're looking forward to having you see us next time. I'm Phil Lindsay. Thanks for watching Artifacts. <laughs>